This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Clean Cause. Do you need a healthier option for a quick boost? Grab a Clean Cause organic herba mate and get your day going with 160 milligrams of caffeine, uh, better caffeine that is, that won't cause crashes or jitters like coffee, like other energy drinks. Uh, now you can choose from eight flavors, a couple of new flavors coming out too, of their sparkling herba mate. Uh, you can try the newly launched non-carbonated herba mate as well, which is excellent. And uh, here's the best part of this. The drinks are great. Got to say that. One of my favorites, of course. That's why they're a sponsor of the show. But here's the best part. Every sip makes a difference in the fight against addiction. Clean Cause donates 50% of their net profits to support individuals in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, so grab a boost, live a better life, transform lives in the process. Head on over to cleancause.com and get 20% off of your order with the promo code SOBERGUY. That's cleancause.com. Enter the promo code SOBERGUY guy at checkout and save 20 percent that sober guy podcast contains adult content merciless truth and emotional nudity listener discretion is advised i'm shane ramey you're listening to that sober guy podcast and we help people stay sober if it's your first time listening welcome i'm so glad that you're here today you can find more podcasts more resources you can also contact us by going to that sober Please be sure to follow us on Instagram at that sober guy podcast. All the links from today's show will be in the show notes, so they're easy for you to find. Our guest today is Jason Lachance. And Jason has a 20-year background in radio broadcasting. Uh, and after going through a divorce and becoming a single father, he started confronting the fact uh, that he had an issue with alcohol. And uh, when he began to speak openly about it, he realized he needed to make some changes in his life and uh, look forward to a more purposeful life in serving others, being of service, helping others. Um, and, and he does that uh, through uh, two different podcasts, uh, in addition to the other work that he does, um, just being of service. Uh, the first one, Knocking Doors Down, um, and he's also the co-host of Don't Hide the Scars podcast. And both those address addiction, mental health, uh, things going on in the recovery community. Uh, and I'm just really excited to talk to him today. He's a great dude. And like I said, he's just been doing some amazing work. So Jason, and he's a California guy too, which is amazing. So it's good to connect with us fellow NorCal dudes. So uh, man, it's great to have you on the podcast today, man. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow. Now I've, I feel so much better about myself. <laughs> we just stopped there. I'm just glowing, <laughs> man. Good. Feeling the love. Yes, dude. I love it. I love it. That's, well, you know, man, like talking about recovery and sobriety and, and, and really just like trying to be better men and, and dads and um, friends and all the stuff, man, just being better in life. Um, it can be exhausting sometimes, dude. It really can't. We got to be better. We got to do more. And, and at, the, at the end of the day, it's more like, let's just like back up and like have some fun and let's just let loose and kind of let God take the wheel. You know, I like that. Oh, all too well. Oh, I, I fought letting God take control and, you know, and, and like I tell people, they're like, oh, you just didn't believe in God. I was like, no, I just didn't believe that God loved me or had a purpose for me. Like yeah. it wasn't, he didn't reject me. It was me rejecting him. It, you know, it was the, it was that story we get planted in our head way back when, you know, yeah. and, and I believed it. Yeah. I believed it. And I was living a life that proved that that was true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know you had a, a 20 year background in radio as well, man. That, that's pretty interesting. I, when you, when you obviously uh, sent me some pre-production notes and stuff, I saw that. That's where did that start? Uh, I was going to college at CSUMB in Monterey and uh, out one night with some friends. Uh, they had a band, had a little trouble setting up, and so I kind of killed some time on the mic. Um, I think one of the dudes blew a tube in his guitar amp or something like, you know, old Marshall stack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And was, so was putting a new one in. And so, you know, a guy ended up coming up to me and was like, you ever thought about working in radio? And at the time, of course, I was drinking. I said, you ever think about buying me a Jack and Coke? And he was like, done. <laughs> and so, yeah, I interned with him for, and he's still one of my best friends to this day, uh, both now sober. Um, awesome. I think it's about six, seven months. I interned, worked my butt off for free. And then, yeah, that was, that was history, yeah. man. Dude, that's amazing, man. So radio takes you into podcasting and just opens up some whole new doors in media. And, um, and how, how did you get into the podcasting space? 
Uh, so knocking doors down actually comes from a, a close friend of mine, his book, uh, Carlos Vieira. Carlos, um, he had a 14 year cocaine addiction. And, uh, when he got clean, you know, started doing some philanthropy work here in the Central Valley, he's got a foundation, some programs that, uh, help kids get into after school programs, keep them away from gangs and drugs, uh, as well as one for, for autism, which touched my heart personally. Like early on, that was his first program that he had under his foundation because my son, my oldest is on the spectrum. Um, so and our friendship just really developed over the years. And then when he saw I was getting clean, he just, he goes, Hey, I'm putting out a book. Uh, I want to do a podcast. Cool. You want to, I'll do a podcast with you. He's like, no, I'm too busy, which he is. He's a sweet yeah. potato farmer. His family, you know, I mean, the dude works like 60, 70 hour weeks constantly. Wow. So, um, so he gave me the opportunity to to start knocking doors down because I had been doing some other podcasts for fun. I do yeah. my best friend owns a financial firm. I do a podcast with him. I do one on Motley Crue just because it's one of my favorite bands and it was fun. And, <laughs> no way. And uh, yeah, and so then it was you know time to step into something serious. So when Carlos presented this opportunity, um, you know I, I was really starting to explore my faith and and spirituality and it just it felt like that's where god wanted me to move that i had done all i could in 20 years of radio and you know it's time to do something with a shift of purpose love it i love it man have you had have you had nikki six on the podcast yet (laughs) no that has been which is funny because i've talked to him i've interviewed him several times Uh um i actually have interviewed all the guys at motley crew but uh but that has been hard for some reason i even yeah. still know the management team and reached yeah. out and was like hey you know b- good numbers and i've had so and so on and nothing, it's all man. about Cricket. timing though it's all about timing i think you know but I, I bet you eventually it, it, that will happen and that i haven't watched that uh i was fl- i don't know if it was on netflix or amazon one of them i was flipping through the other night when i finally got a time to lay down and like it um that popped up the documentary on, or I think it's like a, it's like a mix of like a based on their life, but a movie. Oh, and I haven't yeah, watched dirt. it yet. Yeah. The, yeah. Exactly. The dirt. Yeah. And, and, and the only reason I didn't watch it, not because it didn't look good. It actually looked so good that I, that I, in the moment that I was looking at it, I felt like it was giving me anxiety. Just thinking about what they like their story, just because it was so hard. I was like, yeah, I'm going to just wait to watch this. Not, not going to do it right now. <laughs> uh, they- it had a couple letdowns for me. One of them was I hounded Tommy Lee. Like I had meet and greets like every darn show. I went and saw Motley Crue <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, I want to play you when the dirt movie gets made. All right, bro. Yeah. Whatever you say, <laughs> I don't know, man. And That's you know, we're funny. kind of a similar build. I, I think he's about an inch taller than me, you uh-huh. know, but, oh, gosh, but I'm long funny. and lanky. And, um, yeah. yeah, so that was disappointing. I never got that call, but, uh, uh, you know, there's some artistic licenses in the, in the movie and they, they do a good job actually of poking fun at it. Really? Like, like yeah, they're like, yeah, we know this isn't exactly how it happened, but it's our movie, so we're going to tell it yeah. how we want, you know. Yeah. So Make some fun uh, with it. <clears throat> yeah. But it's but cool. it is rough, dude. Like there's I don't know about you, I have those things that it jumps me back to memories that I keep close. Yeah. Um, you know, cuz they keep me sober. I know some people want to forget, but I'm like, no, I don't ever want to forget because those are Amen the things I jump too quick that keep me from going down that road of yeah. you know knowing how it is where I disappear for a weekend and nobody can get a hold of me and I wake up in some strange woman's bedroom, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. Uh-uh. Yeah. It's, it's funny you say that, that you don't want to forget because, um, you know, I was at a place in called Azure acres in Sebastopol is when I first got sober and there's a, one of the counselors, David in there is big, big dude. And I've told this story before, so I'll make it very quick, but he had these big ass hands, man. His hands were just huge. He was a big dude. And he, he just had been through some crazy, crazy stuff in his life, but he would, he, there was at one point and he pound his head, his fists on the desk and he'd say, you will forget. And he was just saying like, the, the point being is how many times he had seen people coming back through the doors or not coming back dying because they get clean, they get sober, they're living a good life. And then all of a sudden they forget and 
everything comes back tenfold and some of them don't make it through, you know? And so I've, I've always kept that close to me. Like, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to glorify any of the dumb stuff that I did or the lifestyle that I lived before I got sober. But I also keep it in the back of my brain. Just, it sounds like, sounds like you do too. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I laugh at it. And the reason yeah. that like some <laughs> people don't like that, they're like, how can you, you know, laugh at that? And I'm like, I'm like, cause my story isn't a tragedy, mm. you know? And, and it. this addiction thing can be a comedy or a tragedy and it's not a tragedy cause I'm here to talk about it. And I have a sense of humor about it now cause it's how I processed it. <laughs> I've yeah. always kind of been a little bit, I don't know, morbid or whatever you call it. I grew up in a family with a really broad sense of humor. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I have to laugh about these things. Well, I think, I think that's kind of a great transition into uh, hearing some more about your story and your background, and then we'll get into some other things like 12 step, uh, you know, talk a little 12 step, um, even a little church, a little CR, uh, maybe some combos you had with some uh, different celebrities that have been on knocking doors down. Sure. Uh, but yeah, first man, just tell us a little bit about your story, man. Give us some background. So I'm from a family with the uh, multi-generational addiction. I mean, it, it goes back as far as we can trace. I mean, my dad, um, has been sober 24 years now, uh, primarily, uh, methamphetamines, um, and sex and love addiction and tracing that back his dad, sex and love addiction and his grandpa's sex and love addiction. And when we dug into that more and more, the commonality with that part was we all went through sexual abuse in our youth. Um, I went through molestation at around five. My dad, it was continual for him up until about 15 years of age. My grandpa, we're not sure. My great grandfather, we're not totally sure either, but it was there. And then um, my dad's mom, uh, primarily uh, prescription medication um, on my mom's side, uh, I lost two of my one aunt one uncle to addiction one who took their own life the other that it just broke their body down um one of my uncles who i'm closest to uh he's been clean and sober jesus 36 years nice. i mean just amazing you know former former uh paratrooper and you know just yeah. just a real badass of a dude and and then my mom luckily and one of my other aunts who i'm closer to they just didn't succumb to it. My mom started to realize that she's a little thing, five feet tall, and she was out drinking guys twice her size. And she went, ooh, I could be like my dad or my brothers. There might yeah. be something here. And she just stopped cold turkey really before my brother and I were born. I mean, I remember her very rarely having anything to drink or anything like that. But it, I mean, gosh, I was maybe five or six the last time I remember anything. And, you know, oh. she just stopped. So... So yeah, so some of those those generational traumas that rolled into the family and and going through that and I was exposed to hardcore pornography at a very young age and that really was the most longest running addiction that I had. Wow. Um because you know, I didn't even recognize that it was because, you know, yeah. A, we're, you're curious boys and it's, you know, you're like 10, 11, oh, yeah. I mean, you, just, you know, so it's you very think like it's normal. a normal thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember that too at, at um, probably 11, 12 years old, um, just, you know, looking at pornography and it was just like you'd be with your buddies and maybe like you found one of your parents, you know, porns or something and then you'd laugh about it. <laughs> you know, it was like a, it was a thing, but you don't realize till later on in life, like, wow, I was exposed to that, like so young. That's yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyways, go ahead, man. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, uh, great. Yeah. Very valid point. I yeah. mean, you know, you know, a lot of the work that I do and I've been talking to, to um, at some local high schools and some kids had confined in me on the side that, you know, they were like nine. Wow. You know, Dang. and we're seeing, we're, I mean, this, this, you think about it, that accessibility, how is that not a form of molestation, sexual violation yeah. and everything else else of a minor, you know? You just it's mean a, like with the access, because I was, I was thinking it's like, yeah. my, my example was like going in your buddy's parents' room and finding an old VHS tape in their drawer and then put, and then you'd watch it. But now you don't have to do that. You just hop on a phone and any kid can have access to that you know, at, at any, any time a an adult at that too, which is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, um, 
yeah, it's a scary, scary deal how it's molding some minds, you yeah. know, and and it does. And people, uh, excuse me, people discount that a little bit too much. So, yeah. Um, anyway, so going through like my teenage years, though, Shane, I was the guy that got people home from parties. I, I wasn't, I wasn't drinking. I, I, I had some buddies that I could see that, you know, were big pot smokers and kind of how things were going. And so for me, like in a home where I'm starting to learn in my high school years, my dad has addiction. That's why he's gone a lot. Or that's why when he comes home, he's sleeping three days on end, you know, coming off of methamphetamines and all this stuff. So I was just kind of the guy that got people home and didn't really socialize too much at like party type environments, but there's something when I, boy, when I hit about 22 and it was like, wait a minute, like I don't have responsibility towards anybody else. I get a focus on me. I'm working in radio, this insecure guy that's now getting attention where girls are coming up to me and I need a little lubrication, so to speak. And, and that's really when drinking came into my life. And in reflection, I wasn't a, a daily drinker, but I was certainly a binge drinker um, long before I ever became a daily drinker. I, I pretty much usually drank to oblivion. Blackout, like like pretty much blackout done. Yep. Isn't it, yep. Isn't it uh, interesting how there's different like levels of issues too? Like my, like a, my buddy Seth, who helped get me sober, he was blackout like that. Like he would blackout just like... And, me on the other, I, I didn't, it's not like I didn't ever black out. I'm sure I did, but I was more like maintain. Like I, I wouldn't drink till I blacked out. Like a lot of the time you might not even know that I was super drunk, but I was, it, it's, it's weird how there's different. It's almost like a style. You have a drinking style, you know, just kind of <laughs> sad to say, but man, so you were just straight, like a hard, you just went for all of it. End up done for the night. Generally, yeah, generally, I, you know, I can pinpoint some moments, but I wasn't always there as many a times I can remember like, no, I won't drink tonight. I was still yeah. at that point where it was like I could I could take it or leave it. But when I took it, it was like, oh, my God, this is so much fun. And I'm the center of attention. And, you know, as a kid that that felt seen, not heard, it was like, oh, I get to have this shift. And, and the more of a jackass I was, it seemed the more people wanted to be around me and were hitting me up. So, you know, the fragile little ego getting filled and, mm-hmm. you know, you get the text from the girl like, well, where are you going after this? You know, this is in the Nokia days where a question like that <laughs> took you 10 minutes to yeah. type in. So, yeah, it's like all those insecurities, and especially with the sexual abuse, you know, it it left me feeling just so much like guilt and shame as a kid. Um, that, yeah, it was an easy way to start to, it was like, okay, wow, I found a solution. This works. Yeah. How old were you about this time? Is it like late teens, mid teens, early 20s? Uh, early 20s. Okay, got it. I so, think I had my first, like, really, like, first drink. I remember my cousin's wedding, like, a, a sip of champagne or something. And the first couple times, I didn't even like like it. And in retrospect, I was like, did I ever really like it? Or did I just like the effects? I probably like the effects. Yeah, probably the effects. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. No, my drinking really wasn't until, like, legal age that it really started to come to fruition. So how did that progress from there? We, we hear that a lot, like, uh, addiction alcoholism it's very progressive like you're you're good one moment and i I think to your point too of like sometimes you you know you might say i'm I'm not gonna drink today but you know when you do drink you go hard i i know that that makes it sometimes easy to justify well i don't don't have an issue because i didn't drink yesterday but today i'm gonna go super hard and binge drink you know so there's a lot to it it's very tricky that's why it says cunning and baffling i believe um but so your early 20s like how does it progress for you in your own story um really when i landed here in uh, merced um, I moved from the Monterey area, same radio company. And, um, uh, one of my good friends and I, we were doing the morning show. And at the time we had one in five male listeners. That's doesn't matter what your first language was. I mean, we had like 20% of the male audience listening to us in a, you know, 80,000 people area, yeah. roughly. Yeah. Um, so when you have that many people in a small town and you start going out, uh, I don't remember ever paying for a drink. You know, people wanted to drink with you. They wanted to hang out with you. Radio was still pretty big deal about 20 years ago, you know, yeah. and, and, and the, the, the radio station you listen to said a lot about your personality, you know, it's not that way anymore, but it did, you know, yeah. you, you growing up, uh, you know, I mean, I was 
San Jose area is KSJL. That's the rock station. And that's what we, you know, that's what we listen to. So, so yeah, it was just when you start not having to pay and you go out and you simply just maybe even want to just grab a bite to eat, but then somebody comes up and me as a, a people pleaser, it's like, sure. And then it's like, okay, let's do shots. And, yeah. and, and it's not just, it's not just the, you know, the hardworking construction guy or anything like that. Sometimes it was city dignitaries, law enforcement officers. And so now all of a sudden yeah. you're just like, cool to everybody you know this is a little overwhelming for a guy with with yeah. like zero self-esteem i don't even mean negative or positive i mean it, what what the hell is self-esteem you yeah. know it just wow. didn't exist at all so Damn. so yeah so it really started to escalate there and then um my kid's mom i mean i think i was a big lover of toxic relationships and it was the ultimate you know, there was periods I could quit drinking, Shane, but boy, I couldn't quit that toxic relationship. Wow. There was something about it that my relationships and reflection got a little bit more toxic. And then when I ended up in a good one long term, I was the one that destroyed it. Yeah. Wow. So so do you think, uh, you know, as, as you've gotten clean and sober and, and done, um, you know, continuous work on self in, in the past like, do you, have you recognized, um, that some of that toxic relationship, some of the addiction stuff was due to the trauma from back in the day? Like when you were a kid, I think it was completely due to that really looking for an outside solution to my inside problems, looking for somebody else to complete me, to fulfill me. Um, you know, growing up in a home of a codependent relationship, I love and adore my mom and she's owned it, you know, now at this point, but you know, I get her standpoint. She just didn't want my dad to die, which I understand. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, I remember times like, why don't you just divorce him? Get out, you know? Um, and so I think I was, you know, repeating a lot of those patterns. And ironically, now I'm really close with my dad. And I told him this. I said, I think I went down that path to understand you hmm. and to feel close to you. And I, feel so very close and completely understand you better than probably anybody else in our family. Yeah. You know, um, that's a blessing. I'm going to get a little a emotional blessing. here. And yeah, no, it's okay, man. I love it. Thanks <clears throat> for sharing that too, man, because yeah. I, I know that that's some deep, deep stuff. There's a lot of emotion in, in past there. Um, and I think that it's amazing. Like sometimes the hardest crap that we got to, you know, go through in our life, it, it, there's a light at the end and it does help bring, stuff together stronger than before and it sounds a little bit like that's that's kind of what's happened with you and your your dad absolutely you know we've been able to i mean so many things i you know i've talked with him one of his biggest regrets was certainly the porn yeah um and and that type of all that content and everything that was there um and I had a talk with him not that long ago and he was like you know son i'm just i still feel so incredibly bad and you know, I can't make excuses that it was what was put on me and everything else. You know, he owned it. And I said, Dad, I helped two young men last week confront this issue. Wow. 19 and 21. And the 21-year-old was already having impotency issues. So if you don't think this stuff impacts you, I'm going to tell you it does. You know, he, he, he sweet girlfriend, he said, yeah, I can't even get aroused w with her. So, Damn. you know, it's... Uh, yeah, it's poison to the mind. And I said, so it's turned into something purposeful. So let's not yeah. feel bad about it anymore. Let's be grateful. You know, he's a believer of Christ as well. Let's let's be yeah. grateful that our higher power gave us this opportunity to take what we had and utilize it, yeah. you know, because, yeah, then we would be, there's a reason to be upset if you yeah. do nothing with yeah. it, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, let's do something with this. So, you know, it's been a really powerful experience and, um, you know, he acknowledged that a lot of the validation that I sought, I always seemed to have the next pretty girl around and bring him around dad and dad would go, man, you always got the hot women. Great. Boom. Validation from dad. You know, that thing that I was always seeking. So, yeah, I kind of see the overall picture. I've done a lot of the work. I mean, I've hit sex and love addiction, <laughs> anonymous meetings and yeah. counseling, the whole thing, you know. Yeah, it's crazy how God, you know, put puts us on this walk like in a a certain path and we go through like hell sometimes, you know, like in different seasons of life. And then, um, at the end, 
if we can learn from that and turn it around and, and serve others, I mean, isn't that really what it's about? I mean, you know, relationship and love and, and being there. So, man, that's so, so cool to hear. I love too, that you've mended that relationship with your dad. Like that's amazing, bro. Like literally, cause there's so many dudes, including myself who, um, struggle with that and have struggles and have a past with that, that, um, that can be really, really difficult, you know? Is a struggle for you that, you know, like, is you, is your dad not a willing party or what it was? I'm curious what your struggle with that. Yeah. Is. Yeah. No. And I, and I've been, I've been pretty open with this on the show, of course, um, in public and just whatever, but like, so I, I love, I love my dad, man. But like, you know, same, uh, situation growing up in, uh, or similar to like alcohol, drug fueled, like I, I always refer to it as controlled chaos. It was just controlled chaos in my house. Like my, my dad was the controller and it was just, you never knew if it was going to be all good. Cause there was, there was times when it was all good. And then that could go from all good to complete all hell breaking loose in a matter of minutes. And so you're constantly on edge. You're, you can never relax. Um, a lot of financial strain and stress. My parents were super young, you know, when they had me and just no life experience. And, um, you know, so fast forward, you know, to today and I, I love my dad, but I, I have to love him from a distance at times because he's still, um, you know, he's still kind of caught, caught in that struggle, like just the whole, the whole thing of it. And it's just progressively gotten worse as he's gotten older. Um, and I do see it as, you know, I think that's maybe, maybe that's one of the reasons that, um, to your point of like, you said you, you just helped these two young men just last week. And I, I, I really relate to that in the fact of, I think at the, when I really uncover and look at a lot of it, I think that's what really drove me, um, you know, to start sober guy and to continue mm -hmm. going with it is because the show helps a lot of people, which I'm so grateful for. But a lot of the time there's one or two people that you want to help, but you can't. <laughs> and so like there, there's, there's something to that, I think. And that helps to, uh, to kind of keep it, you know, keep me going with it or whatever, but man, I've learned so much and a lot of forgiveness and, and a lot of, um, you know, work in that. And it's continuous. I don't think it ever, I don't think it ever stops, but yeah. No. No. And it's, and it's, thank you for sharing Shane. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's tough when those that we would like to have in proximity, we just can't, yep. it's, it's, it, it hurts and it's okay to hurt and feel that hurt. You know, I, I don't know about you. I, I know you do amazing work with, with, with men. And, you know, one of the things I, I through some mentorships that I've had, um, you know, really stepping into my feelings about that, stepping yeah. into it, you know, whereas it's like, yeah, if I don't really kind of step in, identify, I either act out, lash out on somebody or that, that, you know, that hanging demon is always kind of there that, yeah. you know, the relief is at the bottom of a bottle. So, you know, I just, yeah, I have to step into that emotion and it's hard and there's people I'd love to have close, but I can't. Yeah. It's it, just not healthy. It, it It is really hard too, like you're saying, to step into the emotion and the feeling because I've always said that I didn't so much have a problem with drugs and alcohol. I mean, yes, that's the face of it. But the real problem was that I hate feeling. Till this mm -hmm. day, it's still something that is difficult. I, I feel guilty sometimes because I feel like I pass that on to my daughter. Sometimes I see her. Um, she's kind of like I am. Like She can just turn it off if she needs to. And so, yeah, you have that like kind of guilt, even as a parent, like, man, like, I don't, I don't want to be like, I don't want her to feel she, like she has to be like that, but we're learning, you know, and we're learning together and I'm going to continue to learn. And, um, do you, do you relate to that too? Like the feelings is just so hard and that's probably why we just, it, it's easy to numb out. So I would say it's Tremendous. easy to drink. <laughs> it is. It's so easy, yeah. you know, and we don't, the, 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 the concept that it's disempowering doesn't even enter the mind, yeah. but, oh, I can relate. And I can relate to what you're saying about your daughter, my youngest, that's, well, both of my kids really, you know, my, my, there's some struggles with my oldest, with my son right now. He's, you know, 14 going on 35, <laughs> um, you know, knows Such everything age, about the bro. world. Yeah. Oh, it's so tough. Man. And it's new to me because my dad was gone at that phase, you know, yeah. where people went through that kind of rejection of parent, which is normal. We get these chemicals that get released in our brain and it's what gets us the heck out the house and venture into the world and yeah. find our path. So to me, it's all new to confront that. And then my youngest, there are times I see the shutdown or I have to do a better job of being present when she comes to me 
and I'm sitting and I'm working on something and, and I go, Oh, just give me a minute or whatever. Like, you know, I, yeah. I'll, I, I, I'll write about that sometimes. Like what the hell's wrong with you? Like, the, like, like the video clip you have to edit is so much more important than your child needing you at that moment. And, and that's a tough thing for me. Like I'm a, uh, once I get going, I get going, but it takes some work, you know, I I'm dyslexic. So I like end up hyper focusing when I actually can feel like I'm in a zone, so to speak. And, you know, it's like, what a dick move, you know, here's your kid that just, <laughs> You know, yeah. like you adore it. You don't know how much of like that close proximity time you get. You know, they might want to move yeah. to Sweden or you don't know what they want to do with their life. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like you jackass embrace it. And I, I have to remember to do that because that's good. That though. Is, yeah, that's good. It just, is tough. Just it's so you know, you're, failure. you're definitely not alone in that. So just so you know, and I'm sure there's a bunch of other guys listening right now that are like, yeah, OK, cool. I get that, too. And it is hard. But like being mindful of it. Dude, that's one step forward than, you know, than we had before and that a lot of people have out there. Just being like, because I've been in that same thing where I recognize what I'm doing and it's just a reaction. It's not a response, it's a reaction. And then after it clicks for a minute, I go, oh wait, okay. Hey buddy, I'm I'm sorry. What what were you telling me right now? Cause I'm the same, dude. Hyper laser focused, especially if it's work, I'm into it. Don't interrupt me. Like I think one one of them came out the other day and I was working on something that I had a deadline to meet and they walked out, they walked in, hey dad, da, da, da. and I said, don't talk to me right now, I'm working. <laughs> and like, and, and then I heard him shut the door really slow, and then I just like, was like, oh my God, like that's so wrong. And I, I stopped what I was doing, and I said, hey, I'm sorry about that, you know? So like, you know, I guess recognizing is the first thing, but dude, it's not, it's definitely not easy. Um, let me, uh, so let, let's roll into like, what did, so how, how did you get sober? Like, how did, how did that happen? Like, when did that happen? How old were you? And what was that process like for you? Sure. Um, so I've got a probably about eight years of combined sobriety and I'm at almost, uh, let's see, this is 29 months. I'd have to pull up my sober calculator. I'm so bad with my memory of actually remembering. It's about two and a half years nice. continuous right now. Um, I, I attempted during, uh, my marriage to my kid's mom, um, but, you know, as they'll say, you know, environment can dictate. And so sure. it was a traumatic environment. It was an environment where it was, you know, why can't you drink normal? Which it's like, mm. <laughs> as a couple, we didn't drink normal. There was no normal. There was no, ah, yeah. oh, let's open a bottle of wine. And oh my God, two months later, boy, that bottle of wine that we didn't finish, <laughs> you know, let's throw yeah. that away. No, please. No. Uh, so, you know, I made some different attempts, uh, went to AA, um, you know, never got a sponsor the first time around. Um, and, and it's no offense to the, the people were there. They were doing their best. There's a couple of old timers that it was, was a tough love approach and, and in a, in a really just kind of way. And I had a lot of that in my life and it was not Didn't work ever. Yeah. Never worked. Um, so eventually went back out, went through my divorce and it's been about another two years out, um, got back in the program, had, had a great sponsor. I mean, he really helped me connect with inner child, which like I tell everybody, I know, you know, some people, what's that sounds lame or it sounds like you're a pussy or what? No, like <laughs> that's the part of you that still has fun at like simple yeah. stuff. And he's like, what did you love? I'm like, yeah. uh, building Legos. And he's like, boom. Here's here's a gift card. Go buy Lego. So, so it kind of awesome. got got me back into that thing. Um, and then I think he went back out, and I never got in touch with him. Last I heard, he had moved away, but had some continual sobriety. And I I went out for about another three years, and then uh, it's about five and a half years now. I'm trying to yeah, little six years ago. Uh, almost that uh, I did my second go round of it had just over two years when I fell off again. And that was uh, boundary issues. Yeah. So the lesson I still need to learn about boundary issues. And I'm fortunate that literally, and I don't know if you've talked with other addicts about this. I drove to the convenience store, came home, bought the beer. I was on my third beer, called two people at about two in the morning. Fortunately, these gentlemen answered. But I don't ever remember sober, mind you, going to the store buying the beer. I was in such a state of disarray and yeah. and trigger and you know my anxiety, all those feelings from kids, like like childhood, everything, 
in one moment and then i kind of like came to when i'm like sipping on this third beer like what the what just do? happened wow you feel like it was just magnified like all that stuff it was just like on just on display full force and it it, uh, it almost sounds like it just over overtook you like any sense of like um the ability to rationalize and think and um just total emotional overload yeah uh, you nailed it and it, and that's really when um uh, fortunately someone i met through the podcast that i contacted her and i was um hey i you know tell me if this story is relatable to anybody you've worked with in sex and love addiction and she's like yeah i've heard stuff like that and i'm like i i really need to explore this because it was you know, I was connected to trying to maintain a friendship with somebody that I had had a long term relationship, and and we were just terrible for each other. You know, um, it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of that guilt game. Have you heard people where it's like, well, you and you this, and how can you do that to me? And it's like, yeah. I was an alcoholic when you met me. What's wrong with your picker? <laughs> you chose me. Yeah. This is a two That's way street here. Yeah, this was this was both of us with an abundance of ooh, I love red flags. Let's keep wow. driving faster. So, um, yeah, it, it really helped me kind of dig into that and realize, wow, I had so many different things underneath that that I needed to do above and beyond the twelve steps. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, they're imperative and they you know they open up so much, but you better pay attention to what they're opening up. Yeah. What, what do you think, uh, since, since you just brought that up, 12 step, um, any like common misconceptions that, that you, um, either have experienced or have opinions on, or, or maybe want to share with, you know, we get so many messages like, Oh, I've never been to a meeting. I'm scared. I've had multiple people tell me they paced out in front, you know, for, um, some time and then they finally left and then eventually went and it wasn't as bad as they thought, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, I think, stigma and misconceptions around any type of meeting in particularly 12 step. Uh, I think that people think we're th that it's cultish or a religion in itself, and it's anything yeah. but. Um, I could see like though say, how you know, I could see how people could think that though too, without because j even to your point of the old the older um, you know gentleman who was trying to do that tough love stuff on you know that or that approach with you, um, I, I honestly do think there is some of that in there, like where it's so like you have to do it like this. And if you don't, you will feel everyone's a little different. And I'm not saying that you don't follow the program to that, you know, and, and, but I, I don't know. I, I think that, and then, and then of course, just the cigarettes and coffee, that's like the, the old common <laughs> one too. We're just going to smoke cigarettes out back and, you yeah. know, it depends what meeting yeah. you go to also. Every meeting's different. So. Uh, uh, dude. Yeah, totally. Um, and and I can see where maybe that is that some people do go and get turned off. Like I said, I got turned off by a situation. Uh, and, and some people can get, I guess it works for them to be a little entrenched in the dogma, so to yeah. speak. For me, I had to, like I said, I had to get beyond that. Like now I, I love going to 12-step meetings. I go about once a week now. That's kind of where I'm at, depending upon schedule. But I do participate in several recovery groups, you yeah. know. Um, uh, online meetings. I mean, I made friendships all over the United States and Canada and South America, you know, through, through the recovery process. So for me, it's kind of that getting outside thing, but, um, yeah. I think a lot of people, yeah, so many misconceptions, uh, you know, it's, but it's tough to walk in. It's tough to, totally. I can see that person. I've done the pacing, you know, when it's a new place and I've been to hundreds of of, of 12 step meetings, you know, yeah. but if it's a new one where I don't know anyone, I can see how it is. It's, it's hard to go in and be vulnerable. And I think some people don't think it's a place where they can be totally vulnerable. I think they feel that maybe, or perceive that they got to fall in line, like you're saying, and yeah. you know, this is, this is the only way. And, and it's not that, um, at least not for me, because I don't let it be. And then, and the other misconception is the people that have the issue with the, the God principle, mm. you know, and, uh, and, and what's, what's your I, take I stole on this, that? I stole this from stand up comedian, the stand up comedian Alonzo Bowden. He told me, uh, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, just tell them if, uh, they have trouble with God, think about the trouble God has with you. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah. And he goes, and he goes, uh, you know, and as far as the spiritual side, higher power source, whatever you want to call it. And when it comes to the steps, God's in all of them, yeah. every single one, yeah. you know, 
it, it it's really about you know finding that thing in you that works for you yeah you know so i, I think a lot of people go oh i'm going to be told how how i'm going to connect to that higher power or my purpose or whatever it's like no it's some really beautiful guidelines that are that are that if you work them they're irrefutable i mean i just tell people just give me 90 days give me 90 days and if after that you think i'm full of shit then go somewhere else try yeah. something different but i'll tell you if you really really honestly work it you're gonna see some results yeah yeah i love it man um i think that there's you know that that part we get so wrapped up in um what we believe or what we think we know or the way we see it and i think when we let that guard down a little bit and start to um you know, just like, I guess, I guess surrender is the word. <laughs> I mean, it's classic. That was it's, on top of my head. It's classic. And I know it's a bit cliche, especially when we're talking recovery and stuff, but it's so true. And even when we're talking with having a relationship with God, like surrender is the number one, um, you know, or one of the top things that can help because, you know, ego, pride, all those things, man, especially as a dude. And when we've been raised a certain way or we're just taught, be hard, don't cry, don't feel like, you know, work hard, all that stuff. Like, um, it can be tough to knock some of those, some of those walls down and, uh, knocking doors down. It's gonna be tough to <laughs> knock some of the doors down, baby. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, what, what, what do you think about like personal growth outside of recovery meetings? You mentioned that a little bit, you, you do work sure. outside of that. What does that look like? Um, just to, to finish up on your point, I mean, come on, it's in, it's in our first, it's in step one. I am powerless against, Yeah, you know? So it's like, yeah, once, once you kind of come to that, you've already, you've already surrendered, you know? So just it's, the rest of it's about keeping it going and doing a better life, you know? Um, but as far as outside of it, gosh, you know, Shane, I've had so many beautiful mentors that were people that were indirect mentors and now have become direct mentors. It's It's been unreal just, you know, from authors, influencers, speakers that um, I just, you know, how do they, what's the saying go? Uh, um, stick with the people that have what you want, mm. you know, and that's not a nefarious thing. That's not a, oh, I want their money. I want their wife, their cars or whatever. It's like, no, their spirituality, their, their, their personal perspective, their recovery, yeah. whatever it is. Um, so I just really started there first and foremost, like looking people up and, and have stumbled upon so many amazing individuals that have just somehow now I'm like, wait a minute, we're like peers sort of, <laughs> you know, or mentor mentee at least. Yeah. Um, but for me, things like really stepping into prayer, stepping into my faith, participating, um, you know, my partner, I just adore, she is, I mean, boy, you want someone to pray for you, man. She just, there's something about like God works through this lady and, and, and it's like, it's on the verge of speaking in tongues. Awesome. Yeah. Like where you can just tell like, wow, you are really just, you're connecting with something else. This is just kind of shooting through you and out your mouth. Um, so, you know, we've been participating at our church, everything from, uh, we helped at baptisms recently, which was just beautiful. Um, I've been doing celebrate recovery, ironically, with my my tattoo artist, uh, <laughs> who's got some more long term recovery th oh, than nice. I do, and we're good friends. And um, so, yeah, getting connected with communities other than than the twelve step community has been imperative yeah. for me. Uh, I've really uh, gotten inquisitive about breath work, do a lot of that, prayer, meditation journaling um you know areas that i still need to improve my diet and exercise i don't know why i'm rejecting these things so much i used to be i was an athlete up until i was 22 and yeah you know so um yeah i think it's just uh, th th that exploration for anyone like you know i i find most of us addicts are really intelligent and really inquisitive so get inquisitive especially about yourself Love it. Yeah. Lear learning to know yourself, getting to know yourself better, growing with yourself. And I love too what you're, what you're describing, at least the way I'm hearing it is like, there's so many different paths. Yes. There's different, there's definitely foundations. There's foundational principles. There's, there's biblical principles. There is, um, you know, there, there's a set 
kind of uh, of way or standard, I guess, but there's so many paths beyond that that we can explore to get to know ourselves better in different meetings, um, you know, in whether it's 12 step or in the church or men's groups, podcasts, I mean, meetings, there's so much different stuff out there. And it is when you flip it around like that and kind of make it once you can kind of get over some of the anxiety and, and make it an exciting thing, like, dang, I don't, like, I get to learn about myself, you know, and grow, yeah. which is actually really cool. It's, it's exciting. At least for me, it is. I don't know. Maybe someone out there is like, screw you, bro. I hate this crap. Like, I don't know, but I, I think so. <laughs> I, I'm with you. And I think some of the rejection, I mean, you tell me maybe about some of the newcomers you've worked with or people in, you know, yeah. in your one-on-one -on -one work and your coaching is it's like, look, some of this is, it, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. You're going to have to step into it. And I've used this three times and I stole it from you actually. <laughs> And you're going to suck at some things at first. <laughs> you just yep. are. It's okay. Yep. Like if you're it's there okay. in a meeting, don't feel bad. If you don't have the serenity prayer <laughs> memorized yet, yeah. it's okay. If you need to read off it, if you just need to listen, you know, it's like, don't yeah. sit in judgment of yourself so much. Like, you it. know, you're going to be in a room of people that have been there, man. Totally. <laughs> you know? I, I heard someone, what was this? It was, it was just recently in was it Jordan Peterson. I can't remember who it was. He was talking about how he had learned to be critical of self without hating self. And there's a mm. huge, I mean, that's huge. Like, at least for mm -hmm. me, I, I thought, I said, wow, because I've always been my own worst enemy. And I've always been, there's no one harder on me than me. And I'll give mm -hmm. you even a quick example of this. I had the honor and pleasure, it was so fun, uh, to be the announcer for our Little League um, uh, All-Star Games, the last few games, and m Monday night, Tuesday night. And so I think I did a total of like six games and um, you get different names and sometimes names are hard to pronounce. They look different on paper. And so I was a little nervous. Like, you know, you got a whole bunch of parents around. I don't want to pronounce their name wrong. I was writing them out. You know, in the first game, I remember I, I was, I was doubting myself a little bit like, okay, what's this one? And, and the next one I said, you know what? Like Shane, stop. Like you're going to mess up. You're going to pronounce one of these kids names wrong. There's no, just accept it right now. You're good. And as soon as I did that and allowed myself, like, I'm, I'm probably going to make a mistake. It's okay. The parent will correct me. It's not going to kill them or me. Everything was cool after that. So just accepting that I suck for a minute, I'm going to make a mistake. We're human beings. Like, there it is. You know, it made it so much easier, bro. Like, so much easier. <laughs> I got a relatable story. <laughs> yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> so, so Carlos VR also owns a clothing brand, 5150, mm -hmm. which relates Love to the his name. Book. That's so, great. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, the last night uh, that he got arrested, he was actually booked for a 5150. So got it. he was, uh, you know, cocaine fueled and he was literally knocking doors down and the pimp C song was on, you know, he was just, <laughs> he was in a psychosis. Dang. So anyways, he has, uh, they do MMA events and I do the ring announcing. Oh, and awesome. I have on occasion said the wrong right name, wrong corner. Oh. So wrong color. So red instead of blue or whatever. Yeah. And people, and I'm like, you know, I'm having to apologize in front of 300 plus people. And there was one situation where, you know, prior to the event, I always, Hey, I announced their name fighters. Listen up. And if I get this wrong, please come up phonetically. Help me work it out. I'm dyslexic. This is not a joke. Come help me. So I get it <laughs> yeah. right. Well, this one fighter didn't come up. And I said, Romeo was his name because there was two L's and he had a Hispanic last name. I had never seen the fighter prior to this because he never didn't come up to me. I'm like, okay, I got it right. Yeah. Um, he was a black gentleman. His mom came up after the fight, which he won, and grilled me. It's Romello. Romello. Oh. Say it, Romello. And I'm like, ma'am, I'm Damn. sorry. He didn't come up and tell me that it was was Romello. I said, Romeo. Not, you know, yeah, <laughs> and then somebody personal. else, 10 minutes later from his family, hey, you're pretty good in there, but his name is Romello. I'm like, oh, Lord. Okay. You know? Brutal. And it's the hyper focus. There was 13 fights. I got one name wrong, but that's all they <laughs> talked about yeah exactly that's, how it is. that's, that's such a bummer it dude yeah you got you did 12 great ones and the one like and that's like so funny too you get if you get you can get a thousand positive feedback comments and then it's the one that you know and it goes back to the point of being hard on ourselves like it's just i don't know it's human nature i guess
Well, and even accepting the compliments, right? I mean, I, yeah. I, I had so many people say, wow, man, you're really good at that. Lots of energy. You know, I kind of steal from Bruce Buffer a little bit and kind of pro yeah. wrestling a little bit and, you know, kind of my own little style, but you know, yeah. yeah, to focus on that one guy and still remember his name when I don't remember any other fighter's name that I've ever announced. And I've done like 15 of these, I think, yeah. or something. It's like, okay, <laughs> you know, that sounds but fun. I'll never forget. Yeah, you'll never forget Romello. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got about five minutes before we wrap up. Um, any, like, so who, what are some of your um, favorite podcasts or interviews mm. with different celebrities or, or just guests on the show that you would recommend people could check out? Uh, Charlie Sheen was fun. He was on twice. Um, uh, I recommend Gary Busey. Mm. Because you're going to hear some of the best editing I ever did for people that don't know. Gary Busey does have some frontal lobe damage. So an hour conversation was two hours long and there was points where his control mechanism isn't quite there. Yeah. And, and, and he would just get upset. Like I tried to wrap up the podcast and boy, he went off on me and, <laughs> no way. and his girlfriend. Yeah. His girlfriend's like, Gary, it's okay. He's doing his job. And I'm like, wow. sir, I'm just trying to be, you know, yeah. Uh, considerate of your time and so you kind of get if you listen close you can go oh that's where he he yeah. made a little cut there to kind of you know editing no joke story. too and anytime i think about gary Busey, let's okay let's do a little movie trivia here real quick jason let's see if you can get this sure. here's my favorite gary Busey line ever utah Get me two. <laughs> get, get me two. <laughs> Point break. And he, the funny thing yes. about it, because of the way his his brain trauma is, when we went back to old movies, mm -hmm. different person. Really? It was a different part of his brain. Like when I brought up that I was a kid and I saw the Buddy Holly story and I went, Mom, but you told me Buddy Holly passed away, yet I'm watching him on TV. Oh, and he, wow. he was like, he was overcome with emotion like, wow, you don't know what that means to me. You know, Charles Harden Hardy meant so much to me as a yeah. musician. And, you know, it was such an honor to play that role and be nominated for an Academy Award. And yeah. then two minutes later, I say something that ups him and he's, he's gonna, yelling at you. <laughs> uh, so that was the biggest challenge of one. But there's been so many beautiful people. I mean, Kat Von D, Kelly Osborne, um, when I still had a co-host, Mikey and I, we spoke, we were the first people she spoke to after her last relapse. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and what a beautiful situation to have, um, someone come that vulnerable and, yeah. and own it. Um, been so many brilliant people on here, a uh, recent favorite, a gentleman who has become a direct mentor, Mike Diamond. He's been on a couple of times, uh, Adam Jablin. These are guys that are really out there yeah. helping people in the program and going above and beyond. Um, if you really want to rethink your mind uh dr rob kelly who's been on twice uh, mm. i mean you know it's one that i'll yeah. i'll steal from people when i sit and kind of do one-on-one -on -one coaching shane where they're you know like we've been talking about that voice that gets put in your head and i go you know i'm sorry yeah that that happened to you but know that 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 was somebody else and this is the work that not only on the podcast with dr rob but personally um, connecting with him that he's helped me through. And he's a neuropsychologist in yeah. recovery himself. Crazy story. I'm going to introduce you to him if you haven't talked to him. Yeah, you know, I have. You'll love, would love Dr. To. Rob. Yeah, that, that sounds yeah. amazing, man. I appreciate that. Um, but uh, so many beautiful ones and just, you know, some everyday average people, I guess, from the outside that just do amazing work that may never get any sort of huge recognition, you yeah. know? Yeah. Kind of like you and I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kind of like us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. And we're just doing what, like, man, like, this, you know, I know this helps me stay sober and keep on a, on a good path. Not a perfect path, but a good one. And I, I feel yeah. the same probably for you. Like, this is a huge part of our own, like, recovery process and journey in, in doing this, you know. And so I just, I just want to say thank you, man, for coming on the show today, obviously. And thank you for the work you're doing. Um, it's been great to, to, uh, meet you and get to know you a little bit. And I'm just, I'm excited that we're both Cali boys and we're going to keep in touch mo moving forward, man. I really enjoyed this, this convo with you, bro. Oh, thank you. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor and you're kind of like one of the OGs in this space. You know, there wasn't, wasn't much going on when you kicked in and literally when we started, uh, knocking doors down. You know, my assignment was find other people in a similar space. And you were like one of three podcasts that came up. 
oh, and, awesome. and 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 one of like two people that this was the regular mission yeah. within the podcast and so you know for me it's a real pleasure and it's a pleasure to you know i i think we got a lot of work to do together that we're going to figure out and really yeah. help some people and it uh it feels good to connect with other people that are that are purpose driven. So yeah. I'm I'm really honored. Thank you, Shane. Amen to that, brother. Thank you, man. And um, so if folks want to reach out to you, where can they find you? Social media. Where can they find the podcast? Just give a quick plug, and then and then we'll close it down. Sure, knocking doors down. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube. If you want to watch the full video, knocking doors down on Instagram and Facebook and uh, Twitter. If you search knocking doors down, you find it. I think it's under at KDD Media Company because knocking doors down didn't fit. Um, <laughs> but connect yeah. there. Uh, TikTok uh, KDD Podcast uh, had to do another shorter one too. But please feel free to reach out. You got a question, a comment, a suggestion, or just need someone to talk to at one of those times, man. Yeah. I do my best to to be timely with everyone. Yeah, I love it, man. Jason, thanks so much for coming on today. We'll put all the links from today's show in the show notes for you so they're easy for you to find. I hope some spoke to you today. Share the podcast with a friend. Connect with us on Instagram at That Sober Guy Podcast. Peace, love, and respect. Keep your blood clean. You're the-